Hello, I'm Rajesh Merchandani. Thanks for joining me for the CGD podcast. Now, we all know that 2015 is a very big year for development and climate. There's the SDG Summit and then there's the Paris Climate Conference in December. Well, we're going to share with you some figures today that have stark implications for both of those. They're the findings of a new paper and they suggest that if tropical deforestation continues unchecked, then by 2050, an area the size of India will have been cleared. That's one third the size of the entire United States. And you can just imagine the amount of carbon dioxide that will be pumped into the atmosphere as a result of that and the effect on our climate. That's the bad news. There is a little bit of good news. The same paper also talks about uh, practical and affordable solutions that could prevent this from happening. Uh, the paper was written by research fellow Jonah Bush and by Jens Engelman. And Jonah, I'm very glad to say, joins me now. Nice to see you, Jonah. Great to be with you, Rajesh. Now, let's start with the numbers in the paper. Just take us through what it is that you found. So we found that if, if the world does nothing about tropical deforestation, uh, we can expect an area of tropical forest the size of India to be cleared by 2050. Uh, that's 2.9 million square kilometers. That's one third the size of the US. All the land east of the Mississippi River plus Texas thrown in for good measure. And presumably the amount of carbon dioxide that would be emitted as a result of that deforestation is also scarily huge. It's enormous. It's 169 billion tons of carbon dioxide. That is like running 44,000 American coal-fired power plants for a year. It's one-sixth of our total planetary carbon budget. And the carbon budget is uh, an amount of carbon that scientists say we have left to emit in order to keep global temperature rises below 2 degrees Celsius and stop dangerous climate change. That's right. And we would get through a sixth of this through tropical deforestation alone. Just tropical deforestation, one-sixth of that carbon budget. What did you think when your numbers came up like this? What was your reaction? Well, I knew that there were a lot of emissions from tropical deforestation, but I didn't know it was going to be this big. Uh, and that was because we, for the first time, had the privilege of looking through very high quality, very high resolution satellite data on how tropical deforestation has advanced and proceeded in the last decade. Data that uh, NASA has produced from its satellites that scientists at the University of Maryland have pored over with algorithms, with, with using Google, uh, using huge amounts of, of technology uh, to, to look at forests the size of a baseball diamond. And, and it's, it's, this is just, you know, I almost can't overstate how revolutionary this was when this data was produced uh, in 2013 by, by Matt Hansen and, and, and his collaborators. I mean, what we had before to look at where you know, every country would submit uh, to the Food and Agricultural Organization one number for how much forest they said they'd lost in the last five years. Self-reporting. Self-reported. So and some countries had, you know, they, they, would, they would make their number really high for political reasons. Other countries would say we have no deforestation at all for political reasons. Uh, and, and so you can imagine what a mess that was for previous researchers, including myself, to deal with. Now there's satellites and you can really track deforestation as it happens year on year, right where it's happening. And what we found is pretty scary. And actually. what we found is scary, yeah. So, so we, th we see this pattern that deforestation doesn't just plod along the same amount every year as previous researchers were sort of forced to assume. In fact, it rises very steeply uh, at first, and then it plateaus and eventually it falls. But that's so, over a very long period of time. Over, over, uh, over a very long period of time, sure. So y using that satellite data, you found that the trends for deforestation are going to do what to mid-century? Uh, in places, in, in remote places with a lot of forests left, we, we expect the deforestation, once it arrives there, can shoot up very rapidly. Places like the interior uh, of the Amazon, and the heart of the Congo Basin. And this tells us that actually deforestation rates are going to increase in the next few decades. That's, that's what we project. We project uh, that deforestation rates will increase over time, rising gradually through the 2020s and 2030s before accelerating in the 2040s, if we do nothing about it. So what would be the impact of all of this 
on you know on people in poor countries on on, on development. There there's two. So climate uh, climate change affects everyone on this planet, but it affects poor people the most uh, through more expensive food, through bigger storms. Uh, really, most of the costs of climate change fall on the backs of poor people. So if you can stop climate change, you help development. Uh, the other thing is that by protecting forests, there's a lot of uh, benefits for people who live uh, downwind or downstream of those forests. Forests keep water clean, uh, they prevent droughts, they help agriculture, uh, they, they do a lot of good things. So protecting forests has benefits for development. So on that point, I mean, we've talked about the figures and how stark and frightening they are, but your paper also discusses things that we can do. And you'd look at two particular areas, policy and carbon pricing. Let's look at policy first. And here you look at the example of Brazil as something that other countries could learn from, right? Yeah, so Brazil has uh, done something remarkable in the past decade. They've done more to reduce climate changing emissions than any other country on the planet. And the way they've done it is by uh, really taming the deforestation in the Amazon. They've, they've cut it from its peak by about 80% in one decade. And at the same time, their soy production and their cattle production grew by about 30 to 60% each over that same time. And they did it how? And, and they did it with, uh, with law enforcement backed by uh, satellite monitoring, uh, new protected areas, uh, moratoriums on producing beef and soy in a way that, that clears forests, uh, credit restrictions on, on, on municipalities that were clearing forests. So a lot of very restrictive uh, measures in, in Brazil's case, uh, but very effective. That all takes a lot of political will, but in the absence of that, or in addition to that, you also talk about creating economic incentives to stop tropical deforestation. And one thing you look at is introducing a carbon price, and you've got some numbers on this as well. Yeah, so, 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 so a lot of political will in, in Brazil uh, from uh, President Lula, Minister Marina Silva, they, they felt, you know, there, there was a, a nun who'd been shot. They felt they had to send in the army and clear this problem. But most countries are not in where, where Brazil is. Most countries uh, in the tropics are facing a situation where, where, where people are clearing forests uh, for, for agriculture. Generally, uh, large agricultural uh, commodity businesses that are traded internationally. Uh, soy and beef in Latin America. Uh, palm oil and timber in, in Asia, uh, and charcoal uh, in, and timber in, uh, in Africa. Um, and so the, 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 the key, the crux, uh, we think as environmental economists to arresting the, the problem of, of tropical deforestation is by making forests worth more alive than dead. So that uh, someone, a farmer, is, is deciding whether to, to clear land for cattle uh, or to protect those forests. If the forests have a carbon value that they can, can tangibly receive as income, they're more likely to keep those forests standing. And that's what our paper looks at. We found that a, a $20 uh, per, ton, uh, per ton of carbon dioxide price on carbon emissions would reduce the, the global emissions I told you about before by about one quarter. Uh, $50 per ton price by 2050 uh, would cut those emissions by half. Those numbers, $20 a ton, $50 a ton, uh, if you do the maths and then multiply $20 by the number of tons of carbon dioxide you want to reduce, those numbers can be pretty big, that might scare off policymakers. So let's talk a little bit about where those numbers sit in relation to other uh, proposals or suggested carbon prices that are out there. Yeah, so I want to say that these numbers are actually, uh, they're, they're, they're smaller than they first appear for a few reasons. And one is if you have a $20 per ton carbon price in a market, the cost to people is actually not $20. It's something less than that. It's, it's closer on average to about $9 just like uh, you, know, you, you may pay $100 for your shoes, but it's only costing $20 or $50 to produce those shoes. Same thing here with, with carbon. So there's a bit of a markup. So there, there's a markup that's profit. If it's done right, that's profit for the, uh, 
for the, for the land users, just like they'd get profit from beef or they'd get profit from soy, now they could get profit from carbon. That's the idea. Now, the other thing is, let's compare these numbers uh, to, to a few things. So if you wanted to stop climate change and you only wanted to do it uh, by, in Europe by uh, reducing the cars that people drive or, or the, the, the power plants they're using, it would cost five times as much as it would from reducing tropical deforestation. So what you're saying is that preserving tropical forests is a cheaper way to reduce emissions than uh, could be done elsewhere, say in the U European Union. That's right. If it costs you $100 in the EU, it costs you $20 in the tropics. So the point is that policymakers should not be alarmed by the $20 or the $50 a tonne because it's actually in keeping with other proposals out there. Reducing tropical deforestation is a bargain when it comes to stopping climate change. So does this make you think about what is the role of rich countries in reducing tropical deforestation? So rich countries should absolutely be uh, switching to renewable energy. They should absolutely be figuring out how to make cars more efficient. Uh, but they should also, on top of that, uh, be sponsoring reducing deforestation in the tropics, uh, providing financial incentives uh, to reduce deforestation in tropical countries. Uh, they can do that with payments, with, with, with funds, uh, or they can do that with carbon markets, linking carbon markets in Europe or in California uh, to, to the tropical countries. So you're creating economic incentives for people not to chop down trees. The rich countries are paying for uh, the global public good of a clean environment. Everybody benefits from that and they can uh, reach their commitments to reduce carbon emissions, global carbon emissions, in a way that's financially makes better sense. Yes, it's, it's, it's the you know, much cheaper way uh, to fight climate change. And you know, wh wh why is that? We don't have the luxury of spending all our money to fight climate change. Look, I work on climate change. I know it's important, but all of our colleagues in CGD work on important things too. Uh, global health is important. Uh, fighting poverty is important. Education is important. We live in a world with many important things and scarce resources, and so uh, we, we, we want to fight climate change, but we want to do it cheaply. So let's cast our minds forward to December, yes. to the Paris Climate Conference. In, in the light of your findings, what do you want policymakers there to be thinking about and doing? Well, forests should be a much bigger part of the climate solution in 2015. Uh, all the countries are coming together in the war, uh, to, to fight climate change. Uh, things look pretty good right now. Uh, it looks like many of the biggest countries are putting bold, ambitious pledges on the table. Uh, but there's a worry that forests might fall through the cracks. Uh, you know, some forest countries will offer uh, a certain amount of emission reductions, uh, but it's not nearly as much as could happen as they could do with financing coming in from the rich countries. So we'd like to see more partnerships where a rich country like the USA uh, says to a, a poor country with a lot of forests like Liberia, we will help you achieve many more emission reductions and in return, uh, here's money to do it. Okay, Jonah, sounds fascinating. Um, the numbers are stark. It's great to talk to you about some of the kind of potential solutions. Uh, and I'm sure we'll be back talking about this in the future for the moment. Jonah, thanks very much for joining us. Thank you, Rajesh. Wonderful to be here. Don't forget you can find out much more about all this work and everything that CG does on, CGD does on our website, www.cgdev.org. I'm Rajesh Merchandani, and join me again for the next podcast from the Centre for Global Development. <laughs>